Well, I am here tonight with Dr. Deborah Shapiro. She is a board certified OBGYN doctor, which is awesome. And she's also gone through the Main Street Vegan Academy program and become a vegan lifestyle coach. She's also gone through the Health Coach Institute. It is a she completed that certification program. She's also gone through eCornell as well and completed their program. So thank you very much, Dr. Shapiro, for being here tonight. Thank you, Jean. And please call me Deborah. Just call me Deborah. Okay. Doc Dr. Deb or just Deborah's fine. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. Well, it's unusual that a medical doctor has, has taken your path of education. Could you share with us a little bit of your journey? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I actually had two concurrent epiphanies in a way. And one was about health and one was about animal animals. And I'll start with the animal one because it is fascinating. When I was young, I had no sensibility at all about, about animal rights or animal, uh, animal lives. I loved my dog. I had a pet rabbit, but I also ate animals. We ate spam. And I... <laughs> I know, and I'm so embarrassed to say. And I wore fur. I, it was amazing to me because you know you 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 see children now who are so much more aware, like like uh, like Genesis Butler, for example, right? And, you know, speaking to the UN. And uh, and but I was not one of those children. <laughs> I was not awake, not woke, as they say. So it wasn't until I had actually a patient who told me about a farm sanctuary and I started watching some videos and then I had I actually woke up on New Year's Day and had a premonition about a drowning where we were going at Point Reyes National Seashore and it, it happened just when we were there and I, I just knew after that that I was not going to eat any animals I can't explain why I made that connection but I just knew I had been a vegetarian I had been a vegetarian when I was younger, but I was 17 to 27, but I had never made the connection between uh, the dairy and egg industries. So, so really it, it took until I was quite late in life. And the, the other was about health. And that also came from my patients. I had a patient who was, who came in with a, a miscarriage and it turned out that she had had mercury poisoning. <gasps> and I Yes, and I was actually eating also a lot of fish. I, would, I sort of turned away from meat and, and I was eating more fish. It's so easy to go grab those, those sushi things and I were eating fish quite a bit. So I, and I was having some symptoms. I wasn't aware that they were mercury poisoning symptoms, but they were loss of memory, headaches, backaches. And I was checked and my mercury level was 14. And, so so I, what's, and wait, what's normal for, more, for mercury ooh. poisoning? No normal. There is no normal amount of mercury in your body. We do not well, need mercury. No, no, clearly. no. It That's should be. Point. There should be no mercury. You should not have any mercury. Okay. But I will tell you though, for people getting pregnant, we do. I do. We could talk about it later. But I do like people to detox from fish and from mercury. And I check people's mercury before they get pregnant if they tell me that they eat fish more than a couple of times a week, because I found women to be to have high mercury levels and. What I've, I've read is that from some of the experts is that you want your mercury to be less than four. So the, okay. problem, the problem with mercury, just as a little aside, the problem with mercury is that it stays in your body and it, and it stays in the fetus's body until the fetus can pass stool. It gets, it gets we eliminate it through our stool and the half-life is a couple of months. So until the, until the fetus can actually pass meconium, they're seeing that level. So whatever level you started at, even if you if you start your pregnancy at you know at 15, then that that's the level the ba the fetus will see the entire pregnancy. Even though your level might come down, but it can't get rid of it until it can pass. Oh, anyway, and they can knock IQ points off of your off of your baby. So very serious. So the, the mercury poisoning was a revelation about health. And then I started thinking, and another that same patient who told me about Farm Sanctuary came back and told me about Michael Greger and NutritionFacts.org, and from there. Then the light bulb went off, and also as I had more awareness of animal, of animal rights, and 
and animal welfare and then the environment and that whole sort of package came together and I just wanted to learn as much as possible so I started taking uh, then you know courses the equinel but also going to conferences like the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference every year and Neil Barnard's conference International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine and I took the Ruby cooking course on how to do plant, um, no oil no no salt sugar oil cooking which changed everything for me and and then I just became a guy became a coach so I could really help more people make this transition well you've got a great website a new oh, view of you. food new right of food. yes yes dot com right idea. yes it's yes a new view of food dot com because I I think it is a new way of looking at food. People, people just want things that taste good, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, as we all know that nothing tastes as good as healthy feels, right? So it is a new way of looking at what is food. I would never have thought when I was eating meat and dairy and, and the way I was raised that what I eat now is even food, right? You just don't even think that it's food. Food has a big piece of meat in the middle of it. So, is full of fat and salt and sugar. And so it's a new way of looking at food. You want food, you really want food that reduces inflammation, that reduces oxidative stress, that will, right? So you want food that's going to nourish every cell of your body so that you can live a long and healthy life. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, how were you raised? Oh, it was very sad, very sad. Well, I, was raised on, I was raised, my mother hated to cook. I don't oh. think even her mother cooks. So I don't have that because I know people, even my own spouse, who whose mother loved to cook and cooked everything from scratch. And there are lots of people who were raised that way. And I, I think that's fantastic. I don't even think we ever had a salad growing up. I mean, it was in New Jersey. Yes, I know it was terrible. Oh. So <laughs> it was a lot. We, we In the morning, we made eggs and egg omelets with cheese. And we had white bread. I didn't have Wonder Bread, but it was pretty close. And for lunch, we had some sort of a fake, you know, a meat sandwich, roast beef or turkey or tuna fish. I went to school every day with tuna fish. This was before the big mercury. I mean, you never do that now, right? You never send your child to school every day with a, with a, a mercury sandwich, <laughs> the tuna fish sandwich. And then dinner was some rotation of, you know, pot roast or chicken or fish or terrible, just terrible. And of course, I had to sit at the table until I finished my milk. I mean, the whole thing was just terrible. Ooh. And my mother was quite ill her entire life. And now that we realize she had diabetes, a very brittle form of diabetes. But now, of course, we know why <laughs> she had to take shots three times a day by the time she, before she got cancer in 54. So her life was, was pretty tragically affected by a chronic illness that would have been, I could now reverse. I could have reversed her illness. Right. I know. And my mother was the same way. Oh, because really? She had, she had so many <laughs> health issues you know, because of her obesity and what we ate. I mean, she did cook. I will give my mother that. And every night we had a meat and we had two vegetables and we had a salad first. Oh, nice. And there was typically no dessert afterwards because we had, there were five kids, you know, and there was only milk, orange juice and water in the fridge. So, you know, I give her credit for yes, you know, trying to, to eat healthy, but she was feeding us the wrong things. And you know, all of us, and I really think in my feeling that we're all food addicted. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we have the cell, you know, the, the gene. I heard Neil Barnard talking about this gene, you know, for the food addiction. And I, I, I would say everybody on both sides has it because mm -hmm. I'm the only one who's broken free mm -hmm. and, and changed my health destiny. Mm -hmm. But my mother was chronically ill. And then my father died of a massive whatever I mean, one minute he was talking to us and the next minute he dropped dead. I mean, literally, oh, wow. literally. Oh. went down. That was it. The, the switch flipped off and he was done. Mm. And, you know, so he had struggled with, with high blood pressure all of his life and, and obesity, you know, it, our whole family was. So, you know, I, now I, you know, in hindsight, hindsight's 2020, you know, we see what has happened, you know, to us and we know. Right. How to fix it and how to change it right but, i think people now i think people are starting to see that well they're learning that for a lot of people their their first heart attack is their last right and people have i don't know if people know this but there's someone has a heart attack in this country every 40 seconds i know every 40 seconds is that not crazy 
Yeah. And what's amazing is that heart disease starts in the womb. I heard that at one of the conferences. Yes. What? No, it starts in childhood, but it actually goes back. They've done studies on the, on the blood vessels uh, of, of fetuses. And when, if you happen to be, unfortunately, growing inside of an obese woman who's eating a lot of high fat foods and inflammatory foods, um, you, you will already start to have thickening of the blood vessel wall. Are you kidding? Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. So that's why I feel like it's such an honor as an OBGYN because I, I can have that impact on people and really start to teach women how to get in shape and why you might want to get in shape. It's not just about taking prenatal vitamins because that's all we've ever told people is to take prenatal vitamins. There's so much, there, there's so much we can do to help reverse, uh, to, to lower the risk of complications in, in pregnancy like preeclampsia and, and diabetes in pregnancy. And I, I'm afraid that my college, the American Congress of OBGYN, has not quite picked up on this yet. No. And Isn't so, that, doesn't that make you want to beat your head against the wall? Yes. I mean, seriously. I mean, they're still promoting three milk products a day. I, I need, they've made some changes. I've actually looked at their new, their new recommendations for pregnancy, but it's, uh, but it's still three milk. They still, I don't know what it is. How much does that dairy industry pay them? I don't know. And they're still promoting, even though we know it's not there, that is not a good calcium source for people. And we know from that huge Swedish study that there's more, more osteoporosis and more osteoporotic fractures and more death from all causes when women have three milk products a day than when oh. they have and does that translate over to the baby? Would that translate over? I mean, you know, the woman consuming the dairy products, you know, is that going to have an impact on, like, say, the skeletal development of the, of the fetus? Or not that, it, not that I'm aware of. Not that I've studied. Not that I'm aware of. So I don't know. But I think, okay. you know, the, the, the skeleton is going to be growing their entire lives. So it's just important, I think, for young people to be getting enough calcium, but really prop, but from plant sources. Right. Also, or... or Calcium fortified soy milk, for example, would be excellent, especially for young girls to reduce their risk of later breast cancer, right? So, right. Um, so right. other reasons to have soy. Oh, and there's so much misinformation about soy. Oh. Well, I think we touched base a little bit about this, but did your parents suffer a lot or? Oh, yes. So, yes. Yeah, so I said to them, my mother already had that she had diabetes. She, she actually had a lot of heavy bleeding and needed a, hyst a hysterectomy for fibroids when I was very young. So she was just about 40, 41, and then had diabetes all of my life. And then by the time she was 54, she got a brain tumor, a glioblastoma, and she died in six months. Wow. And that was very tragic and sent me into a tailspin. My father actually- How old were you then? I was 14, 15. So very, oh. bad, very bad time to lose your mother. My yeah. father lived a good long life. He, had, he lived to be 86, but he also had prostate cancer. And and later another cancer, probably, possibly because of the radiation for the prostate cancer, but he got something called multiple myeloma. But he, he actually had a better diet than my mother. He, and also he, he never smoked. He walked every day, sort of methodically walked, he exercised, and, and he cared about that. And he also ate a lot more, I think more fruit and more fiber in general. Mm -hmm. But he did have a lot of dairy. He really had yogurt every day, which now that we know it really is associated with prostate cancer. And so... And all of my uncles all had cancer, either one or two, if they lived long enough. So very sad. And I actually, I would say that was part of my, of my sort of growing wonder about, when you talk about your health destiny, I absolutely thought as I got to be about 50 and the age my mother was, or 53, that this was my destiny to get cancer. And I thought, we were taught in medical school, it's all just genes, right? We didn't, we were not taught, right? But I went, let's see, D Dean Ornish published his, um, lifestyle heart trial in 1990. I was in medical school from 80, 85 to 89, so I wasn't wasn't aware of that. And then we got no nutrition in medical school. And now, of course, with his all of his work with prostate cancer, he's shown that with lifestyle changes, you can change, you know, 500 genes, right? That that suppress cancer and and uh, 50 genes that doesn't it make you want to beat your head against the wall again yeah it's like why why would you not teach the doctors about the fuel that runs the body explain this to me i i don't know if it was a i don't know how much of it was big business because when you look at the kinds of studies that have been that have been funded by industry and how much and how how much press 
they get. So, you, you know, that, that's part of it, but I don't, yeah. So researchers are hired by industry to show what, what the industry wants to show. And they've been very good at that. You remember the insider, the insider, the tobacco industry memo that was, that, that they found yes. that says doubt is our product. So they just, but, but we're getting. And that's what they're doing a very good job. Oh because yes. And that's one of the things that a lot of people that I help coach, they're just so frustrated. It's like, at one minute, eggs are good for you. The next minute, eggs are bad for you. The next minute, eggs are good. Yeah. You're back on good. And, you know, and they're yeah. frustrated because it's like, you know, they keep hearing this report, that report. And it's like, uh, who do I listen to? Right. The right. keto people, the keto people are just, they're, they're just maniacal about this. I mean, they just, they get a lot of press and a lot of airtime and there's some, yes prominent doctors that have really sort of gone over to the dark side and, and been promoting this as well. And they're, they've been on public radio and it's been very, but you know, you, you can't pay attention to all the noise. You just have to keep, keep promoting what's right. And I've actually, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the interesting egg studies, for example, is that they wanted to prove that eggs don't raise cholesterol, but we know that after, after an hour, there's a spike in your cholesterol. So they just measured it first thing in the morning. So they measured the, the cholesterol spike fasting and then they gave them an egg and they said see eggs don't raise your cholesterol because we right because you know after an egg after an egg your eggs your, your cholesterol spikes and then over the next seven hours it goes down so that's but nobody who's going to look that closely at a study to see when do they measure how does it really work what's the science there no and there it's smoke and mirrors it it's is smoke and mirrors. Totally. it is it is. Well, it, Why, but it's with people's lives that's what i don't understand there's so much yeah. suffering there's so much suffering we spend so much on healthcare. We spend almost twice as much as the next westernized country spends on healthcare. And our outcomes are, are not very good at all. And especially in terms of perinatal morbidity and mortality, and it's not good at all. So. And I see it in the classroom. You may see it, you know, when the kids coming out of the shoot, you know, or in the beginning stages of, of their life. But I see it in the classroom. I've been in the classroom for over 30 years and I see a huge huge change in our children and I mean like a severe in, you know incredible incredible increase of ADD ADHD you know cognitive learning and being able to process things mm -hmm. they really have a hard time processing and and, and, I, and I know all the technology has not helped either I mean that's just that's a whole nother mm -hmm. ballpark but I don't teach the way I did 25 years ago because these kids can't handle it today. Wow. I mean, to the level of, of you know, how I teach, no. I've had to really, really dial it way down. And even the kids at this point are like, <gasps> you know, I can't handle this. I mean, and they do. They have a really hard time. They don't know how to study. I mean, I, I just see it all the time. I just do. And we don't know if it's a be if this is because of all the art of all the pesticides that they're exposed to and the, and the chemicals and the we don't know right I know but it makes me absolutely crazy when I see the kids now our school you know they have breakfast lunch and dinner at school and it's you know it's a private school and the school you know the lunch it has to, I have to say the food is pretty good but they do have choices of animal foods you know meats and and dairy and other things but they offer other alternatives too. So I have to say, you know, overall the food's good, but then the kids after school are starving and will go to the vending machine and then they'll come out with absolute crap. Artificial colors. I mean, those are all uh, supposed to be terrible for them, right? Well, and I look at this, I look at the, the food that they're consuming and the only, they only have two choices of a drink. They have water, which is one of the, uh, it's a, a bottled water and I'm not going to say which one, but it's basically distilled water. Okay, it's from one of the big, big companies. And they, that, I've tested that, and, and I do a huge lab with the kids in chemistry on that. That has, that bottled water comes in at a pH of about five. So that's, and not only is it, have a, have a very acidic, but it's got a high ORP, oxidation reduction potential. So it's very, very oxidizing to the body. And you, you think that water shouldn't be, right. but it is. Why, why would they have water that was a, that was that would have such a low pH? I've never heard of that. Oh, don't get me started because we'll never finish okay. the interview. I have to. I don't know about that. We'll have to talk offline. I don't know anything oh, about that. 
oh, <laughs> I can fill you with a, a lot. Because it makes me crazy. And the other thing they have a choice of is Gatorade. Oh, and Gatorade is extremely acidic. Mm. It comes in at a pH about three. So we're talking something that's 10,000 times more acidic because the mm -hmm. pH scale is a logarithmic scale. Mm. Factor of 10. Right. So it's like 10,000 times more acidic than what you're supposed to be drinking, mm. plus the amount of sugar that's in it mm. and the dyes. Mm. And it's like, <laughs> what could possibly be wrong with this? And the kids drink it and think they're drinking something nutritious. Wow. Well, and doctors still tell people when they're sick to drink Gatorade. I mean, that, I, I, I see that too. Yeah. Anyway, we're, yeah. we're, we're digressing. Yes. <laughs> so, this is fascinating. I mean, yes. so... Your, your medical training didn't prepare you at all for this. Oh, no, no, no. We, I, I remember a few hours. That's all we got. And when they would talk about the calories that were in carbohydrates, protein, and fats, and that was about it. I don't remember much. Now, actually, that, that's tr they're trying to change that now with I don't, Dr. Clapper has been all around the country now speaking at medical schools, talking about nutrition, plant-based nutrition. And Neil Barnard's group, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, is trying to get, uh, I think, five hours of mandatory CME in plant-based nutrition. Not keto nice. <laughs> to nutrition, but plant-based nutrition, yes. Excellent. So we'll see if he can do that, but it's, it's important. I remember when, a few years ago, we, we all had to do 16 hours of pain management. So this is certainly as important, if not more, more so than that. Yeah, because you can yeah. control a lot of the pain with food. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So right. what do you attribute to becoming a, a plant-based doctor? Well, I think both this awakening about the environment, the animals, and my own, and our own health. And I needed more time to spend with patients. I felt like it, it wasn't, you, in, in a one 15 minute visit, you can't, I mean, you can plant a seed, but you really can't help someone transform themselves from being a carnivore, a meat eater, to someone who's really thriving on a plant-based, on a, on a plant-based diet, so. And it's true. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I started my program is because, okay, you may go to, I mean, if you've got a good doctor, you know, like on the East Coast, you've got Dr. Robert Otzfeld or Dr. Michelle yes. McMackin, you know, they're fabulous. But they say, okay, start a plant-based diet. And you're like, uh, uh, what does that mean? You know, and how do you begin? And what do I do? And, you know, so right. they can guide you to it. But, you know, that's why I created, I have a, a plant-based basics, kind of like a boot camp. And so I take people through the basic things that you need to know to start this way. How do I begin? How do I transition? And then I have a continuing education program because the key is you have to keep continuing, continuing to educate yourself. Right. So right. that is yes. key. Yes. So anyway, what, what about, what about your thoughts on medications? Well, I'm not anti-medications by any means. I mean, I'm, as, as I am a board certified OBGYN and I, I try to fo follow to a large degree, ACOG guidelines, you, you have to, and for medical legal reasons, and also uh, the just the standard of care in the community. I would never withhold antibiotics if someone had a bladder infection. I don't right. treat bladder infections with herbs or whatever. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really an alternative. I don't consider this alternative medicine. So I practice, I practice evidence-based medicine but I plant is, I also practice plant-based nutrition and, and, and integrate that into my, into my medical care. So uh, if someone is suffering in the menopause and, and is, is miserable with hot flashes and night sweats and anxiety and can't sleep, and you know, certainly I can talk about, I can talk about soy, but if they, if they need hormone replacement therapy, I'm not anti-hormone replacement therapy for short periods of time, you know, not long-term. And if somebody wants to be on birth control pills or that would be the best thing or an IUD that has progesterone. I mean, I, um, I, I would do that as well. So I certainly, I certainly prescribe medications. And I know that Kim Williams, who's the past president of the American College of Cardiology, he loves statins. He talks about statins and the statins are important. So, and statins work to, to lower your cholesterol and lower your risk of heart disease. So, uh, so a heart attack. So I'm not anti-medication. Okay. Well, as an OBGYN, what impact have you seen in your patients that have gone plant-based? Well, some remarkable changes, especially about bleeding patterns. So if you can get somebody who's having heavy periods to give up dairy, 
I've seen that work immediately. Like people say, it was like night and day. As soon as they stopped, it stopped all the hormones that are in dairy, um, they had regular, regular lighter periods again. And I've seen women who've had polycystic ovarian syndrome who weren't getting periods regularly, who changed their diet to be plant-based and also uh, eliminated some of the advanced glycation end products, the AGEs, because those are associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and AGEs are in fried food, cook, food cooked at high temperature, including plant-based foods, you know, like French fries and chips and things like that. And eliminated also exposure to as many endocrine disruptors as possible. So some of those are like BPA in, in linings of cans and BPA that's also in receipts that we get, but their, P, their PCOS also resolved and they were able to have regular periods again. I had one patient who had dysplasia. So she had the uh, human papillomavirus and abnormal paps and she didn't want treatment. She didn't want me to do a leap or what. So I said, okay, well, we give it a little time, but you need to go on a plant-based diet and add extra green tea because green tea is very, is full of antioxidants and very uh, active against the human papillomavirus. You can actually make warts disappear if you put green tea extract on them. So, or at least in studies, I have never done that. Okay. And it, they say it works and her HPV went away. Now you could, I mean, it's possible it can come and go. It's possible. There was less stress. Who really knows? But then I know when she went back the next six months, when she went back to eating a regular diet and she gave up on this diet, it came back. The next test to her HPV was back. So, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And what Did else? Did she go back after that? I think we, I think she found that it was, what did we do? She, we, I, th I believe she did. I don't think we ended up treating her. I think, I think she did decide that she would try it again. So but then I left my practice and went to Kaiser. So uh, what else? So they've been certainly very lovely pregnancies, just painless pregnancies, wonderful pregnancies. They were not complicated by hypertension and diabetes and preeclampsia and all of that and, and lovely, easy births when people were plant-based. So that was fantastic. Those are always wonderful. I've only had a few people who really wanted, who were already vegans and wanted to have really excellent uh, plant-based pregnancies and they did really well, really well. And not enough, just, you know, not enough of an end to say it meant anything, but still. And I had one woman who had chronic liver disease and she was a little heavy also. And an older woman, she was already probably in her seventies, but she went on a plant-based diet and her liver function test came way down and she was able to go down on her medication and her doctor was amazed. I know, aren't they? Didn't think it was possible. It's a miracle. It's a miracle, I know. But I want to tell you, I was able to get my cholesterol to go way down as it should. But one thing I would do, and I'm sure your listeners know because they've been, they've been paying attention to what you've been posting, but uh, oh, coconut cool. oil, but coconut oil is really atherogenic and it causes, it is full of lauric acid, which raises your LDL cholesterol. It's not these you know, MCT oil, like medium chain triglycerides and everything. Everyone thinks it's so good for your brain, but actually no, most of coconut oil is just, well, not to mention just that it's oil, but also that it's lauric acid, which is very, it raises your LDL. So when I first, became plant-based, before I took the Ruby cooking school class, I was roasting my vegetables in coconut oil and my cholesterol shot up. My LDLs went up to 120, they'd never been that high. So when I learned how to roast on parchment paper without oil, they dropped to 60. The only difference was no oil, 120 to 60 my LDLs, just getting rid of the coconut oil. So I, you know, maybe I'm just a very high responder to coconut oil. Maybe not everybody is, but for me, it was a, it made a huge difference to my cholesterol level. You mean the coconut oil is not the miracle drug that everybody thinks it is? Boy, it's really, that's a hard nut to crack. But yeah. I mean, if people want some coconut, you can eat coconut, eat the whole thing. It's hard to eat a lot of coconut, but it's hard to chew a lot of coconut, but when people just use the oil and it was so easy just to melt the oil and just pour so, I don't know how much I was using on this. It tasted great, <laughs> but, but, yes. but now I'm much more aware when things are, you know, if you go out, you have, sometimes you're in, a, you're in a situation where you may not be, but I sometimes with around at work and they, there was a lunch the other day and I said, well, I'd really like to bring my food. And they said, well, you know, everyone's, this is a lunch for you guys and everyone's going to be eating. We have food for you. I felt that I needed to eat what they were eating and they had some stuffed, oh, a stuffed uh, mushroom cap and portobello mushroom and boy, it seemed really oily. So once you really change your palate so that you don't need that oil anymore, then even things that normally would just taste fine 
with too much, too much oil. I'm always saying that things are too salty. Yeah. And even the sweet, you know, you don't need it. No, it's amazing. Once you calm your brain down and your tastes change dramatically. Yes. I mean, I remember I used to absolutely adore honey glazed Dunkin' Donuts. Oh my God. I mean, don't get between me and the box because you'll get hurt, you know? I mean, seriously, I'm down for three at a minimum. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, you have to understand, I'm a food addict. Right, right, right. I'll be the first to go, hi, I'm Gene Schumacher. I'm a food addict. I'll be the first. Yeah. But somebody had left one. I went plant-based, and I hadn't had one, like, in in quite a few years. Mm. And somebody left one in the, the teacher's lounge, and, you know, I opened up the box and, you know, it looked like this. Nobody's looking. Right. Right. (laughs) And there was one left and it was a honey glaze. And I'm like, clearly that has my name on it. And I started to eat it and I I spit it out. And if you had ever said to me, I would spit out a honey glazed donut, I would have said you're on drugs because it's not happening. And I spit it out and I'm like, oh my God, did they change the formula? This sucks. This is awful. And it just, my my tastes have changed. Right. It takes a while. Oh my God, I thought it was awful. And I was like, this, this, this is bad. Right. But my taste buds have changed. And, right. you know, now to me, like grapes, oh my God, do grapes always taste this good? I mean, you know, they're fabulous. Right. You and know? for me, medjool dates, like if I just need something yeah. sweet, then yeah. just a couple of dates. I mean, how many dates can you really eat? I mean, I think after three, you're just kind of sugared out. It, it's true, you know. Yeah. Oh, and I'll take it to the next level. I'll put a little Brazil nut. I'll break that oh, yeah. date open. Put a Brazil nut in there in the middle of that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I like yeah. Walnuts are great. Walnuts are no, great. no, no. I do the the Brazil nut for the for the selenium. You need exactly. the exactly. Yes. yes, ma'am. You saw <laughs> yeah. that video too, huh? Oh, yes. Four. Yeah. I have four. That's it. I have four yes. of my Brazil nuts. That's we great. We get it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, one of the things that I have seen of late and and have heard through friends, whatever, that that girls are starting their period really young mm. and i you know i've heard people say that some of the kids are like in second grade mm. I, what yeah. when i when when i was going through it okay i'm not like up there with the you know dinosaurs or anything you know i'm not that old I, well at least i don't think i am but you know i i you know i, I just I'm, we were teenagers when we started our periods but right. kids, second grade? Oh my God! Please, that's seven, eight, nine years old. I'm, I've, I've heard people have have said that their daughters are starting at that age, and t- to me, that just is mind boggling because at, at that age, or ten, or eleven, you're just not ready to have a baby. Right. You know, physically, mentally, emotionally, to go through all of these changes plus the hormones. What can you attribute to this? Change. Well, what I've heard is not so much that they're getting their periods at eight or nine, although some maybe, but the age of actually getting your period may still be around 12 or 13, but, but they are starting to get breast buds. They're starting to develop. They're starting to go through puberty much younger. That's happening at a younger age. And I believe that this is due to the hormones in our foods. Um, the, the animals have been are now being given hormone growth hormones and hormones to make them grow faster and quicker and bigger than ever before. And if you look at the, the pictures of, well, I always like to watch It's a Wonderful Life. Do you, do you ever watch It's a Wonderful Life on the holidays? I'm kidding. So, Every right. Christmas. Well, if That's you look at it closely, there's a there's a chicken that they they're eating at the end. The very one of the last scenes is their holiday dinner, and there's a chicken. And I swear we could probably buy a chicken breast that's the size of that, or a turkey breast that's the size of that whole chicken. And that's been the, the evolution that now we've been, we've been genetically modifying and also giving hormones to these animals and we're, we're eating that. But also all the hormones that are being given to dairy cows to make, them, to make them give more and more meat. And even if you get, even if you get the BHT, the, I think it's, 
what is it? It's the recombinant, some sort of growth hormone that they give to cows. But even if you get the milk that doesn't have that, that's hormone free, they have their own endogenous hormones. These, these cattle have been, they've been genetically modified to be able to give milk while they're pregnant. So can you imagine the amount of estrogen and progesterone as they get later and later in their pregnancy? They're, they're pregnant for nine months like we are and, and they're being milked the whole time. So and then all that milk gets pooled and then it gets, so it gets, concentrated into these products like cheese and yogurt and Greek yogurt. And they're getting, we're getting a lot of hormones and it's terrible. So we're seeing more, more breast development early. And then of course, more can more breast cancer, more prostate cancer. So the, the, the hormones, especially the dairy hormones, we, we just don't need it. I, it's very, it's, it's, it's amazing that they're still pushing milk products on us and it's just not a good calcium source and it's a terrible protein source so and it goes down i mean the, you you try and tell people and they're like what are you talking about what do you right. you don't know anything and it's like right. you might want to start checking on that i know but also also too i'm wondering two things like chemicals like parabens because your body it's not but your body interprets it as like say an estrogen and it's mm. bioaccumulative do you think that could also be causing things? You know? Yes, all the yes, and there are, there are other endocrine disruptors that oh. get bioaccumulated in sort of fish, especially things like dioxins and and the PCBs. I mean, some of them are carcinogenic, and we don't even know these effects. As a matter of fact, when we test chemicals, when they test pesticides, they they test them individually, right? right. But we can be exposed to hundreds hundreds all the time and nobody knows what what effects they have together right you know, do they work synergistically or what what are they doing in our bodies exactly so, uh, that's another reason to think about when people are thinking about getting pregnant to really detox start start eating organic and really detox from all these chemicals as much as you can well so, and the personal care products and i'm just going to put a plug in for the ewg yes. You know, mm, the environmentalworkinggroup.org, yes. they've got two yes. key databases mm -hmm. for personal care products. And it's not just, you know, they call it the cosmetic database. It's not just makeup, but it's shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste. Because literally in 26 seconds, if any of that stuff is on your body, in 26 seconds, it's in your bloodstream mm -hmm. and accumulating. And some of these things, like, like they don't have to put on like the labels. Like if some of these chemicals mix together, that are in there, they don't have to put the end result. And some of them, like they they create what this chemical called 1,4-dioxane, which is huge. It's got huge problems and, and causes a lot of, of health issues. Yes. Yes. And they don't have to list that um, in terms of the ingredients because no. they didn't put it in. It just magically happens while it's mm -hmm. inside their product. Right. But, you know, I, it makes me crazy. And, and that's one of the, my biggest staunch things because mm -hmm. I'm a chemistry teacher and, and yeah. I have my students, they have to go through, it's one of the projects that I have, that I offer them to go through their personal care products and to look at three products that they're currently using. You know, and then I have a whole bunch of things they have to go through. Is it an organic molecule, inorganic and, you know, so forth and so on. But, but then they have to look at what impact that it's going to have on the human body. Is it an endocrine disruptor? And, you know, it, a lot of like, for example, shampoos are neurotoxins. I'm like, mm -hmm. what, what? You're putting a neurotoxin on my brain, your head, right. on my head, on my brain. Really? Mm. It just makes me crazy. It, it, even like, like going back to babies. I mean, like, you know, Johnson and Johnson used to put formaldehyde mm -hmm. in their, their, their baby shampoo, which you're using on babies. Well, and what about the baby powder, the whole bout, oh. you know, that in ovarian cancer. And yes, yes, yes. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Don't even get me started. We'll never finish all these chemicals. <laughs> it makes me crazy. And yeah. nobody has a clue. Because I guess I was raised, you know, to think that all personal, if a personal care product is in a store, that somewhere along the line, somebody has said this is okay for humans. Mm -hmm. Nope. Well, it was, might have been okay for the rabbit. I mean, there's still these horrible tests. And we're trying to get rid of these tests. You yeah. know, all this animal testing too, right? So it's in the uh, yeah. 50 and yes. I know a lot of people now are making their own are making their own products to use on their skin only using well it's products. nice and i'm just going to also put a plug in for pure haven essentials because this is mm. a company that was started by a girl who was 15 years old mm. and she had read the environmental working group they had done a body burden test on teenagers and on average it was like 281 chemicals in their mm. bloodstream and it was absolutely incredible wow. so she's like wait 
you should be able to buy products that are not toxic. So she started this company and now the company has, it's, it's incredible. Every product is non-toxic. Wow. Every one of them. They don't use preservatives. They don't use nothing. And the products are amazing. I mean, I wouldn't say if they weren't, you know, but I'm putting a plug in. So if anybody needs some, you know, but use the environmental working group. I mean, seriously, yeah. that is something that is, is has to, you have to do your research. You have to become an, an ingredient detective. Okay. Sorry. I'll get off my soapbox. That's great. That's so, great. I love the environmental worker group also oh, for yeah. um, this clean 15 and the dirty dozen. I think that's yes. important. A lot of people don't always have access to, um, to organic produce. And so using that guide can sort of help you if you have to buy something. Um, exactly. But also the water, I recently just put in a water filter because I was just, um, it was pretty, it was pretty distressing to hear what I was getting through my tap. I know Dr. Greger talks about tap water. It's fine. Just drink tap water. Maybe that's fine where he lived in DC, but where I live in Burlingame, not so good. So the environmental working group, look up your water district and see what's in your water and then get an appropriate filter. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, wish it wasn't our water. Good. Well, the chemicals that were and the whole process of like the, when the water goes down your drain and then it goes to a, a chemical recycling plant. Okay. A water recycling plant. They're not designed for the over 10,000 chemicals that we're being exposed to. They're not designed to take those out. Most of those chemicals are very small molecules and go right through the filtration process and they just come right back to you. Not only that, but in a lot of these, because the water is so acidic right now, okay? And the water that's coming out of your tap is the only federally regulated water that there is, okay? The, all the bottled water products, no regulation in any way, shape, or form. They can put anything they want in there, and they do. Mm -hmm. And But anyway, going back to the tap water, the tap water has to come out of your tap at least at a neutral, like, 7, a pH of 7. So the water is so acidic from all these chemicals. What they do, then if they add sodium hydroxide, that's Drano, mm -hmm. to the water to bring the pH back up, okay? Now, if you test it, the water coming out of your tap is extremely oxidizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just it's like, oh my God. Anyway, sorry, 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 sorry. We've got, we got off on, on this. No, so, oxidative stress is one of the major drivers of disease. So it's important. It's true. Right. It's true. Absolutely. So we have a lot of baby boomers, you know, that are coming up through menopause. And can plant being, going plant-based help menopause? Yes, fascinating in Japan. I don't know if you have any Japanese listeners and maybe they could comment on this later, but I've been told that in Japanese, there's no actual word for hot flashes, but I don't know if that's really true, but that, that's what I was always taught. And it could be that the people in Japan are raised eating a lot of soy products, whole, whole soy products, miso and tofu and edamame. And so they just have an easier menopausal transition without all the hot flashes and night sweats that we get here. But uh, I've had many, many patients in menopause, and I always recommend more of a plant-based diet anyway, but definitely more, more whole soy foods as well, because I think that has been shown to help. Not always in every study is kind of tricky, but I think enough that it's, I recommend it also because of the usefulness to reduce the risk of breast cancer. So... Uh, a plant-based diet also helps your mood, your um, your sleep, um, excess excess weight. If, if excess weight comes off, I think you'll just be more comfortable in general, even if you do have hot flashes and night sweats. So uh, I, th I think in terms of just dysbiosis, another driver of disease is trying to get your, your digestion better, in better shape. Uh, only good things can happen when you're, when you're plant-based. So I think it can help at any stage of life and especially in the menopause and then particularly probably more soy can help it. Again, I, I just feel like it needs to be something that we start earlier in life if you want to see people really benefiting. There's, right. there's one thing about having people already, already sick and needing to reverse disease, but it'd be really great to see what happens if we start young and we have kids growing up, vegan kids growing up, they'll be taller, so Rosalie, which is fascinating, and healthier. I, I was at a conference where a woman who's a doctor way up in one of the parts of Canada, the sort of a Western area of Canada, but very high north, very, very far north. And she said she's seeing diabetic kids. These are kids in their teens who are already suffering from, they're getting amputations 
because of how severe their diabetes. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that? I was blown away. Oh my gosh. Yes. So just a diet, you know, just starting from day one, just a, a, a terrible diet, you know, full of saturated fat and cholesterol and, and sugar and, and processed food. And they're actually, we, you know, we hear about kids getting diabetes at a younger age, but if you actually heard of kids suffering from the kinds of end stage complications from diabetes at a younger age. Wow. Wow. Amazing. That is, oh my gosh. Well, another thing that I hear a lot of women have issues with is fibroids. fibroids. Yeah. Can a plant-based diet help that? Supposedly, yes. Uh, I was just reading, and you can always look up anything on Michael Greger's website, nutritionfacts.org, but uh, I, I think anything that reduces your, your exposure to excess hormones because mm -hmm. estrogen, estrogen feeds fibroids. We know that because they shrink in menopause. So when women are eating more, um, more, more dairy, they probably get more fibroids as well. And then the advanced glycation end products might also be involved. And I'm trying to think if he had mentioned something else, animal products in general that raise insulin like growth factor one. So, you know, animal protein raises insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, and that just drives growth of anything, any tumor in your body. So anytime that you can be on a plant-based diet or reduce animal products, you're going to have less IGF-1 and less of your own endogenous estrogen as well. So IGF-1 is very important for, for that. There might also be a genetic component because African-American women seem to have more fibroids than Caucasian women and Asian women. But and I'm not sure if there have been any studies looking at African women and African-American women, but cert certainly the, the diet of African-Americans is particularly high in animal protein and fat. And none of that is good. None and fried good foods. Health. I mean... And fat, right. Fried foods. Yeah. Yes. Aging. Wow. Advanced glycation and products too. But it's animal protein that seems to be a major driver of growth and through IGF-1. Okay. Let's go back, let's circle back to polycystic ovarian syndrome. What, what causes that? I'm not sure that anyone really, really knows. It's, a, it's, an endo, it's just an imbalance, a hormonal imbalance. And women, it's, also, it's, you, it's often found in women who have this, like, this triad of insulin resistance, obesity, and some hirsutism, some excess hair growth mm -hmm. on their face or their, or their chest or their tummy too. Uh, so. It, it makes people more at more risk for developing diabetes later on mm -hmm. and metabolic syndrome. It sort of goes along with, but I've also found very thin women with PCOS as well. So it's not always that there seem to be higher levels of AGEs, advanced glycation end products in the urine of women with PCOS. So the best diet is considered a, a low fat plant-based diet without a lot of fried food. And, and that includes things like potato chips and, and french fries and even well, even what about putting like the french fries in the air fryer because you can cook them without oil i don't really think it's the oil i think it's things cooked at extremely high temperature does the air fryer cook things i think advanced glycation end products are it is interesting because i don't we'll have to ask dr gregor i can ask him at the next conference where i see him uh, about advanced about advanced glycation end products and the air fryer how hot, how hot do things get? It's really about temperature. It's not about oil. It is. It's the, high temperature. It's 400 oh, well, degrees. Then, then I would be concerned about AGEs in anything cooked at high temperature. Okay. Be better, it's always better to cook things, well, to boil, like wet heat. So boiling things and steaming mm -hmm. things create less AGEs than roasting and broiling. Okay frying. So I don't think it's about the oil necessarily at all. I've never heard that. Uh, the same with heterocyclic amines, other kinds of carcinogens that are created when, when foods are cooked at high temperature. It's not so much about the oil, it's just that they're cooked at high temperature. Like advanced, like heterocyclic amines, which are cooked, which are created when, when meat is cooked, animal products are cooked at high temperature. That's when you're eating barbecue and charred chicken, the way my mother-in-law likes it. But charred meat, th those are heterocyclic amines, and they're, they're carcinogenic. And the, the mo one of the most important ones is FIP, P-H-I-P, a heterocyclic amine. But they're also polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, 
and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are produced when even plant-based foods are, are cooked at high heat, like french fries. And I'm, okay. I'm afraid that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons might even be created in the air fryer. But you know, it, it's not about perfection. It's really, if you could do everything else, if you could do everything that we've talked about well, you could eliminate all the excess, all the, a lot of the chemicals, and, and just fill your body up with a lot of raw food and a lot of fresh raw food all the time. And then if occasionally you have something that's, I don't, I don't think that's really going to be a game changer for you. Okay. For a person. But well, if you have PCOS, are, is there any special within the whole food plant base that you should focus on more, like fruits and vegetables, anything in specific? The, some of the healthiest foods are greens and beans and berries. So it's probably always good just to fill up as much as possible on uh, just because the major drivers of disease are oxidative stress and lipotoxicity and um, inflammation and dysbiosis. So if you can really try to eat in such a way that minimizes all of those, so a low fat whole food and, and, and maybe even high raw, which is about 75%, 40 to 75% raw would would be wonderful if, if you know if you could make sure that you eat a huge raw salad every day with legumes on it um but had you heard something else i'm trying to think of uh, something else i mean i think that dr gregor just talks about what i've seen is is really just reducing yeah yes yeah I don't think there's anything else. You know, reducing um, also, and we talked about endocrine disruptors. So, right. but of course, so uh, BPA line cans, you try to avoid as much as possible. Just buy, I mean, canned, canned food is, is fine. And Eden brand always, um, they have BPA free. So, so they say. So they say, right. But then there's, there's other, there's BPA. Yeah, so there's some other chemicals. I, I don't know, maybe they're just using, switching one for another. It's not, you know, you can go to places and buy grains and legumes in bulk, organic, if you can, and that would be the best way. And if you have an Instant Pot, you can really, you can make them in a snack. I know. God bless my Instant Pot. Yes. God bless it. I, I have two. I have two. Oh, wow. It's changed they my go, life. Uh, yeah. And they're going all, because I batch cook on the weekends. And that's yeah. what I do is I prepare a ton of food over the weekends, a couple of hours I spend in the kitchen, and then that lasts pretty much all week. I mean, there's some mm. things you can't cook for the whole week, like steamed kale. That flames out after two right. days. I mean, done. I mean, right. yeah, right. You know, and then it starts to stink the refrigerator <laughs> up, you know, and you're like, yeah, I got that right. out of here. But right. for the most part, I can prepare most of the things for the whole week, oh, you know, great. and maybe like by Wednesday or Thursday, I might have to, you know, produce a few things. But other than that, I spend several hours on Sunday batch cooking and I'll usually make, I have uh, potatoes. I do a big thing of potatoes and cook them and then put them in the refrigerator and then they become resistant starch. Right. And then right. I've got- Much less glycemic index, lower glycemic yes, index. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So then I have rice, you know, some kind of, you know, brown rice that I've got in, in the fridge. I like a short grain brown rice or a jasmine, you know, those, mm -hmm. either one of those. And then I'll have beans, some, some form of beans. My favorite is, is cranberry beans. Yes. And they're delicious. Oh, my God. I uh, really like them. They're just so creamy and uh, nice flavor. Yeah. We found some purple, these purple beans. They, were, they just looked like, I, I put a picture on my website, but they just looked like little works of art. Each one was, was different. They were purple and white. I, they really, it looked like an art project. They were gorgeous. And they, of course, when you cook them, they, they didn't stay purple. Right. But they were, still, they were still so meaty and so wonderful. Right. I mean, in, a, in a good way. I mean, having a lot of texture, I shouldn't say that they were meaty because they were not. I like, knew what you meant. <laughs> I knew what you meant. But I'll have all of those things in my refrigerator. And then we make salads. You know, we, we yes. pack, get all that lined up for the week and then yes. steam kale and right. make, you know. So it, it, being prepared, that's half the battle. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's maybe even more than half. It's amazing. It's so important to always, I remember... Uh, before I was plant-based, really going to work with almost nothing and just relying on what what I could find and scrounge and absolutely ridiculous to live that way. I have a I had one client who batch cooked on the weekends for her dog, but made her own dog food, but never but could never batch cook for herself. She could never really get that together. There okay. Is, 
Well, I do that for my dog too. Yes. I make my dog's food. Oh, wow. That's good. Good for you. And I make it and I spend like one week, you know, like one Saturday afternoon and I'll just make a ton of it. And literally it lasts me for two months. I have a freezer. Oh. And I'll make big, you know, I make it into tubs and I'll put the food wow. in the tubs and the tub lasts a week, you huh. know, and I make enough for, for about, you know, two months at a time. That's fantastic. So, That's yeah. great. Oh, you're wonderful. That's really good. Well, That's- you know, my dog, because if you start to look at, if you talk to any vet, you know, they'll say nine out of 10 dogs that come into this place can be fixed if you change mm. the diet because mm. most of the dog food is awful, mm. you know, and it's just like people. My vet told me this morning that there's a, there's a, an animal, there's, I think a humane society down in LA that's starting to do a study on, on giving their dogs vegan food, not vegan, vegetarian. But I think, I think actually it's vegan. I'm not sure, but it's, they calling it vegetarian food and they're going to be doing a study about it. So that's pretty Excellent. Good. Yeah. It's going to make a difference. I think, I, I think so. I yeah. think so. Well, I have this education program talked a little bit about it before it's for people that want to be plant-based and don't really know how to start so i have plant-based basics so that i have continuing education so people don't really understand the power of this and you know it what i help them to do is focus on how to change and how to change their lifestyle but what what advice can you give a person that's just you know to prepare them mentally physically emotionally to begin changing their life to plant-based living Honestly, I think what, was, what is the most important thing, what I found in coaching, is that you have to forgive yourself. You have to forgive. And sometimes you have to forgive. You might be really holding on to a lot of anger that's turned against you, but it's really because of people who have, who have hurt you. So you have to really forgive them. It's very hard to do. But then sometimes it's actually about forgiving yourself for getting yourself into whatever mess health-wise, weight-wise, work-wise, stress-wise, you got yourself into. But you have to forgive. And I think until you can really love yourself enough, because like you said, you bash cook every day, you take every, you know, every week, you take the time to create all this wonderful food so that you won't be just you know, out, out and about with nothing and scrounging for something and maybe get, having a donut call to you. So... It, but, but that's because you love yourself, right? I mean, you, you do, you have to. If you don't care about yourself, you will not want to nourish yourself as you need to be nourished. So it really is about finding that, that love of yourself and forgiveness. You have to forgive. So I always think that's the most important thing. And I think people have a lot, they really struggle with that. And it's true. They don't want to go on because they realize that there's a, there's a place where they, they can't forgive themselves, and so they can't, they can't take it to the next step where they do the batch cooking and they feed themselves well every day. But they, don't, they don't love themselves enough. Okay. Don't you think? Don't you, do you agree? I agree because the, uh, well, there's, it's not just changing your food. There's so much more. I mean, there's, there's the emotional side of eating. Mm-hmm. There is you know, the, the food addiction. Oh, my addiction. God, it's real. It's real. Right. Oh yeah. The sugar addiction. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think, you know, there's just, you've got, there's so, and I call it like peeling back layers of an onion. Right. And as you start to change this way, you start to learn a lot about yourself Mm -hmm. and you know, your relationship with food, which is very complex, you know? Yes. And it's been that way. I mean, for our whole life, you know, that we've had it, you know, whether your parents rewarded you with food and, you know, how, how you approach it, you know, it, it's just, it's so complex. Yes. And so yes. it's not just the food that you're changing, but it's a lot of habits. It's a lot of, of. Associations. Associations, Associ- and associations right? I yeah. think, yes. And every time when we come to up on holidays, I think it becomes yeah. uh, really acute, right? And you go to Thanksgiving and you just want, you want what you used to have. And to try to make new associations and new habits, but also new traditions. I think that's, that, would, that would be the pinnacle for me. I haven't really been able to do that exactly because I still have in-laws and we still have to go. I bring my own, I bring my own food to Thanksgiving and to Passover, but, but it's tough. It's tough that it's still a dinner around a dead animal. For me, as an ethical vegan, right. it's hard. I think a lot of people are not ethical. You know, they're there for, the, for, for their health. Alternatively, there are people who are just ethical vegans who are not the healthiest. 
because they're there, they're there just for the animals and they don't care enough about health. So I think it's important to strike that balance. That's why we talk about being whole plant food, no salt, sugar, oil, right? That's, that's, that's really the goal or as much as possible. Absolutely. My sister says it's impossible. My sister tells me that I should just be trying to get people to do 50%. I'd say, well, if you do 50%, percent you will get 50% results, you know? Well, I use, the, I use the analogy that, you know, I've got a pretty good punch, you know? I mean, if I came up and punched you every day, poof, and you'd be like, doctor, ow, my shoulder, it hurts, you know? Can you give me something for the pain? You know, if I just stop hitting you, right. okay, then the pain's going to go away and your body's going to heal. But, and here's what people do is like, well, I've been good for several days, and mm -hmm. I'm just going to cheat a little sure. bit. That's okay. like me, instead of coming up and hitting you every day, I come up and hit you <laughs> once every or twice a week. Right. And tell me, do you think that's going to still hurt? Right. Yes. That, yeah, that's so, a good analogy. It's true. It's, it's true. true. I mean, and right. that's what we're doing to the body. I mean, the food that's causing inflammation, it's causing... You know, and that's what the pain is. You know, right. I've had people, when I was teaching, I taught this course at a local community college and I did, you know, four Saturdays where we taught, you know, basically I did what is whole food, plant-based, then I did went into the research, then I did uh, how do you begin and then tips and tricks. And the first week that I started, the, this woman who was in chronic pain, she was probably in her mid forties at the time. And she'd been on pain medication for about 10 years and for chronic inflammation, arthritis, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. arthritic pain. And not a day went by that she wasn't in phenomenal pain. And she said the, the, the pain meds did nothing. I mean, they just made you not care about the pain. The pain was still there, but just made you not care. Right. And she went home, she took embraced this. She listened to what I had to say. She went home and cleaned out everything. Mm. And she started that night. So this was a Saturday night. So by Thursday of that week, she got up and she started moving around and she started, she went to go take her pills. And as she's reaching for the pills, she realized for the first time mm. in over 10 years that she wow. wasn't in pain. Right. Yeah. And when she came in on Saturday, we were passing the tissue box because you cry a lot in this lifestyle because uh -huh. you, it's just amazing right. the, the, the success. The success, And yeah. she couldn't believe it. In just like five days, the inflammation had calmed down enough that she wasn't in pain. That's incredible. I mean, after being yeah. that way for over 10 years That's on heavy-duty pain meds. Right. Wow. So, well, I've heard about the reversal in the uh, diabetic uh, uh, peripheral peripheral neuropathy and that happening in 10 days too, right? People have been in pain for 20 years and then they went on a plant-based diet within 10 days. But I had success also with a client who had terrible osteoarthritis. She had actually, she was a police officer and now morbidly obese and she had a she had already had a tibial osteotomy, a surgery on her knee, and had a plate put in. And she was told that she absolutely was going to need a knee replacement, and that was scheduled. But she was working with me, and we lost a lot of weight. And she had been a vegan, but a junk food vegan. So she really became an oil-free vegan. She got off of her blood pressure meds. She lost a lot of weight. And she went in to see the orthopedist to prepare for her surgery. And they said, I don't think you're going to need this knee replacement. And she ended up not having a knee replacement. She ended up, all she needed was to have the metal removed. So now yeah, she had the metal removed and now she can do these yoga postures that she'd never been able to do before. She can bend her knee all the way. She, her whole life changed. And it was all because of the, the she, she went from stage four osteoarthritis to stage one on a, on a whole food plant-based diet without oil. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, like yours, like your, like your patient. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. absolutely. It's really, it's, but what's incredible is that she tells, she cannot get her mother to call me. Her mother has all kinds of health problems. So it's, it's still, it's a very tricky because we're still the minority. I mean, how many Americans are, are vegans are on a whole, what is it? Three, five percent, three percent. It's very small. So it means if you do it, you might have your own community, but when you go out at large, you're still the minority and you're still going against what your family does and what your, most of your friends do. And it's still very hard. It's hard for people. It is. So the, yeah. I, mean, I think we shouldn't, yeah, I think it, we should accept that. We, we need to know that. But it's hard for people to make change. It's not easy, but amazing things can happen. And again, I just think nothing, nothing tastes as good as healthy feels, right? Right. 
do you know what? I love this quote from Dr. Uh, Kim Williams. I don't mind dying. I just don't want it to be my own fault. I like that. I, you know, and I think it's not that we're living longer anymore. I think we're dying slower. Yeah, we're spending a lot of time not well, a lot it's of time. True. Yeah. It's true. I mean, my mother-in-law went into a nursing home at 72, 72. And she was starting to lose it. I mean, in, in terms of into a nursing home at 72, she had, you know, Alzheimer's. And she, you know, within a very short period of time of going into the nursing home, she completely, and of course, you know, what wonderful food they give in nursing homes. So within a very short period of time of going in, she completely lost all ability to recognize oh. anybody. Oh, how awful. And yeah, and she went in. No, here's this part. She went in. It was $4,000 a month. We had to pay out of pocket. Mm. By the time she died, when she was 79, seven years later, because they said the average life in the nursing home is five to eight years mm. with Alzheimer's. She went in, and by the end of the time she was done, it was $9,000 a month. Who puts aside that kind of money for when you get old and you can't function anymore? Right. Well, I bought long-term care insurance. And actually, because of, my, because of my labs and my diet, I got quite a bit off, $400 a year off of my long-term care insurance. Pleased about that. So do you know that Dr. Dean Ornish is doing a study now with Alzheimer's? So he wants to reverse Alzheimer's the same way that he did with heart disease and then again with early-stage prostate cancer. So if anybody... Any of your listeners know of somebody who has early Alzheimer's, they might want to contact DeanOrnish.com. Nice. And get okay. in on that study. Well, I know Dr. Barnard talks about this in his book, and I've done a whole series with him on power food for the brain. I broke his book apart, and then I grilled him. <laughs> oh, I've got it right there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was checking it. I have it. Yes, I have all this book. It's amazing. Yeah. And he talks a lot about Alzheimer's and, you know, obviously when you're at my mother-in-law stage, you know, where she was, mm -hmm. I think there was a, several contributing factors. One uh, clearly was the diet, but she also retired at 55 and just sat in front of the TV and did nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mentally she wasn't stimulated and she was eating the wrong foods. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she was a little bit overweight, but you know, not massively, not morbidly obese or anything, but you know, I just think the, the foods that she was eating, you know, and just sitting there doing nothing because you have to stimulate. If you don't use it, you lose it. Right. I have this incredible photograph of, it's a cross section of blood vessels from the, from the brains of people uh, who are, who do not have Alzheimer's and the brains of people who do. And the atherosclerosis is remarkable. If you don't, th if you don't know that Alzheimer's is partly atherosclerosis of the brain. This photo is, is incredible, very powerful. But also knowing about the heavy metals that are involved in these uh, neurofibrillary tangles and the plaques. I, I grew up not knowing about this, about aluminum and, and copper. And I know when I've looked at my patient's vitamins and looked at what was in them, and at the very bottom there's copper. You really have to not be getting heavy metals from your vitamins. Right? So, don't need copper from me. Get copper from copper, nuts and seeds. iron, and zinc. Those were the three that Dr. Barner was talking right. about. I think Especially aluminum zinc. also. Possibly aluminum also. Well, he did. I mean, but the yeah. the ones that okay, right. we don't need aluminum. I think we can right. agree upon that. That the body has no need <laughs> right. for but aluminum. Don't take zinc. Right. It's true. Right. Right. So that was you know one of the first things I tell people is right. to get rid of your aluminum pots and pans. Get rid of yes. them. Right. Throw them out. You know, right. use them as a planter. Whatever. Right. You know, but, uh, but the copper, iron, and zinc are micronutrients and we still need those. So we're, we, we still have them. this mentality is if, you know, if a little is That's good, good. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's get the, the semi truck in here with the ton, you know, yeah. and. Right. And there are people making so much money on, on supplements and it's very disturbing because their, their hearts are in the right place but i mean there just is no need to and i really i love the purity of the message of just eat whole plant foods and organic if you can get them and organic please as much as you can because it's good for the farm workers too you have to think about the earth and the runoff and the fertilizer and all of that and the dead zones and the whole the whole thing and and sometimes there's certain products even if they're plants uh, like uh, palm oil one of the reasons I don't eat vegan donuts right now is because they're fried in palm oil and palm oil is also destroying the rainforest. And, and 
And so, and right, so it all it all fits together. But you don't need to take you need to take B12, and then I think probably most people are deficient in B. We're all slathered in sunscreen, and we don't have the same access to light. And then the omega threes. Gregor does say some uh, algae based omega threes for your brain. It's probably a good what idea. What about walnuts? Wouldn't that work just as well too? Well, sure. There's walnuts. There's walnuts, and there's chia seeds and hemp seeds and flax seeds, and those are those are great. He still recommends a little bit extra because I think we don't we don't convert we don't convert these these foods uh, the to the to the long chain fatty acids that we need. So it, the conversion decreases, and we don't want to load up on too much. You just want like a handful of walnuts and. Maybe it's enough, maybe it isn't. He does, that's what he recommends. He does recommend 250 milligrams. Certainly if you're pregnant, you should have some extra DHA and EPA for the baby's brain. But definitely not from fish oil because oh my God. it's so contaminated. Anyway, by 2046, we won't have to talk about this if we're still here because there won't be any more fish. I know. Is it, is this just so sad? It's really just good. so sad. I mean, we've so outfished the waters and just yeah. the coral reefs. I mean, the coral reefs are dying and that's kind of like, uh, the barometer of the ocean right, you know right. when coral reefs go that's it I mean, right provide... it, it, yes, it's, it's incredibly sad that people even with children like i don't have children but i would think that anybody who had children and grandchildren would be forward thinking enough but but people are not which is and i understand i you know what i hear a lot i don't want anyone telling me what to eat but i think about a child who's saying to his parent I'm going to put some Coca-Cola on my Rice Krispies, okay, or, or on my, or for dinner, all right? And, they, you know, what's a mom going to say, right? Of course somebody told you what to eat. We were all told what to eat. This whole idea of, I don't want anyone telling me what to eat. It's ridiculous. We were told what to eat. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just so in, ingrained. You, you don't think about it. Someone told you that you needed meat and dairy every, over every meal. Someone told you that you needed meat on your plate to be healthier, to be strong, and you really internalize that. But, you can you can relearn <laughs> you have to we have to this is the year the economist said 2019 this is the year of the vegan and for the environment and for our health and for the animals and i'm, I'm really hoping that we can all make this happen you're going to make it happen and i'm going to try to make it happen and i'm trying yeah i am too We're i'm in the process so of I'm trying to set up a plant-based educational retreat on cape cod mm. oh lovely nice yeah. That's right. great. Good for you. Thinking that's so, great. Yep. So setting that up for people that want to immerse them, have an immersion program yes. and education and how to cook, cooking demonstration, cooking hands on, hands on deck. You'll be part of it. So oh, I think those are very effective. I, I, I do like this ongoing. I have a, a six month program. I really, I, I think especially for people who have a lot of weight to lose. I think it's nice to have some hand holding all the way through because there's so many times that something could happen a holiday can happen a party can happen that they need some support so i like this one-on-one -on -one, and maybe it's not maybe it's not a way to reach the masses right now and maybe later i'll be doing more but right now i'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and i think that there's a place for that as well for people to have that that kind of hand holding and well, how would they reach you would if they wanted to have you coach them how would so they reach you they can reach me through my website, www.newviewfood.com, or they can just uh, they can email me at debrashapiro1 at gmail.com. Nice. debrashapiro1 at gmail.com. Yeah. Okay. Well, is it important when people begin transitioning to a, a plant-based diet, is it important to tell their doctor that they're doing this? Oh, yes, absolutely. Especially if you're, if you're trying to get off of medications. And I always I have a disclaimer on my, even though I'm a doctor, I'm not being a doctor when I'm being a coach. So I, I ask them to definitely tell their doctor if they want to get off of medications because very quickly, if you change your diet, you're going to see a decrease in your blood sugar and a decrease in your blood pressure. And it can bottom out if you're on medication. So you have to stop it. You'll very quickly be able to come off of your, if you, especially if you do oil free. I've seen people who continue to eat food, plant based food, but a lot of some processed meats, I mean, some processed vegan food that has a lot of sodium in it and a lot of oils and their blood pressure doesn't change that much and they don't really get off of their blood pressure medication. So if you want to get off of your medications, I would recommend going whole plant food and really minimize the oils. And then you'll see, yeah, and then you'll really see the difference. And or the blood sugar, again, if you're on, if you're on metformin or something that's lowering your blood sugar, you have to stop that because it's, once you change your, your diet and lose some of that fat, you're, you're going to be able to, 
eat, eat all the food you want and not worry about your blood sugar. So important to tell your doctors that you're doing that so they can keep, uh, keep an eye out. Excellent. Okay. What about protein? Should we be concerned about protein? <laughs> there's, there's just the right amount of protein in plants. So fruit is about 5% protein and vegetables is about 15% protein and, and legumes and grains have even more protein. There is never, I have never taken care of a, any a vegan who was protein deficient. Now, that being said, I think if you were 100% raw and you were not eating any legumes, I think it may be possible. I believe Kim Williams' mother actually had some hypoalbuminuria, albuminemia and low protein in her blood and actually suffered from that. So because she was 100% raw and it's not big enough protein. But you would have to be on a 100% raw diet without, with really avoiding sprouted legumes, I think, to be protein. So we need 0.36 grams of protein per pound of ideal body weight or 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight. And so I think for women, uh, you need about 45 grams of protein, and it's not hard to get. Even the lowly potato, I think, is 4 or 5% protein. So uh, and actually, that amount of protein, let's say, um, eight, let's say about 10% of your calories or 8 to 10% of your calories from protein, that, which is the RDA, you, that already builds in a little bit of a buffer. I think you really, really need even less. But... If you are older, over 70, or if you're pregnant, these are times when maybe you do need a little bit more, maybe 10% more. And I know that uh, Brenda Davis talks about that in her book, Becoming Vegan. So I think, uh, if you are pregnant, I would definitely refer to Brenda Davis's book, Becoming Vegan. She has a whole chapter on pregnancy and childbirth with meal plans. You just need to be a little more conscious about getting high protein foods at every meal, especially in the second and third trimester. Right. Would you have any other ideas you can share that would help people to become more successful eating whole food plant-based and hopefully continue? Well, I think already, I mean, the work that you're doing is fabulous. And I think just edu educating yourself, maybe taking that Ruby, if you don't know how to cook without oil, that Ruby cooking class of it's Forked Over Knives has a, a three month, they have a one month, a three month, and a six month. Uh, the three month was great for me to really learn how to cook without salt, sugar, or oil. A lot of tips, very important. I think there are some, fantastic websites like nutritionfacts.org and, and Dr. Greger's book, How Not to Die is Fabulous. And That was powerful. I know. And Neil Barnard's books have been amazing. And his website has a lot of, uh, a lot of educational materials. P. Colin Campbell's website, uh, uh, which is the Center for Nutrition Studies, the Plant Nutrition Project has mm -hmm. tremendous information. So there, there's, no, there's no lack of information. But the problem is that trans, really it's 20% it's information and then 80% transformation, so to really put it into practice, to learn how to batch cook as you've done and to, and to be prepared and to start to foresee what's going to happen when I go to this party on Friday night and everything's going to be this kind of food. And like, what am I going to do in this situation or that situation or the family dinner? And I think that, I think coaching is great for that. And maybe being part of an online group where you can sort of chat with people and talk about it is also fabulous. Amazing. Well, that's what, what we do in our group. I mean, yeah. we have each other for support and, you know, through the, we do it through Facebook and we, you know, post pictures of our food. We share with each other what we're doing. And if somebody makes a mistake, you know, like if somebody posts a picture of something that's not, you know, correct or whatever, then we'll gently, you know, say, hey, you might want to think, rethink this because, it, you know, here's the problem with that. Right. And we, you know, we teach a lot about what's caloric density and to help people to understand that because that's one of the things, you know, because in yeah. the beginning you lose a lot of weight, but then you hit like a, almost like a plateau right. and, you know, how do I break that, that plateau? So I think the videos, I do love Rich, um, I'm sorry, um, Jeff Paul. Novick's, no, uh, Jeff Novick's, how to eat more, weigh less and live longer. That's a fantastic video. And yeah. also uh, Doug Lyle's uh, The Pleasure Trap. Oh, anything with Doug Lyle, please. I mean, he's just so amazing. He yes. really is. He, I learned so much from this man. He just, and he explains it in a way that you're like, oh, right. got I it. Love it. I love got his it. shark. I love his shark, his little drawings. Like, of course yeah. he knew that was a shark. Yeah, he's great. He's fantastic. They're both wonderful. And he's got such a great sense of humor. Yes, very dry, very dry. Yeah. So, 
yeah, I think education is good. And then having the support, I think it's important to be part of a group, uh, probably important, I think important to be part of a group, an online group is fantastic. And also for me as a, as a coach to meet people where they are, when you say, you know, correct, it's not correct. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. If you're, if you're looking, some people are really not, not at all there yet. Right. And even when they start with me, they say, well, I'll never give up Parmesan cheese. <laughs> and I say, okay, all right, that's okay. You won't give up Parmesan cheese. Maybe I'll find a, you know, an alternative for you and show you that you really can make it with this and that. But um, it's, I, th I think it's important to, to meet people where they are and to just, like you said, nudge, you know, just keep meeting people. And then they feel so much better. I mean, I had a, I had a patient who really reversed her Crohn's uh, so that they did another, uh, she had another CT, I believe, and they said there was no evidence of Crohn's anymore. And she actually decided from being on the couch, unable to even get a glass of water, she asked her daughter to get her a glass of water because she was just so low energy. And so she couldn't leave the house in the afternoon because she couldn't know, didn't know if there'd be a bathroom for her. And, and now she's off in graduate school. She applied again, she's gotten graduate school, wants to get a PhD. So things, things can happen when you're pricking people that you, they don't even realize at the time that, that are even possible to happen. You just think you're going to eat more plants and you don't realize you're going to actually get a PhD in anthropology, you know? So uh, anything can happen when you're feeling more energetic and more positive about yourself and, and your health is better. Right. Well, I also, you know, you, let's, let's circle back to the food. I just want to put, put a plug in for Plant Pure Nation. Yes. Because they have amazing husband approved my husband loves these dishes uh, you know for me they're a little bit high in sodium okay fine because i am just super uber salt sensitive i mean seriously like ridiculously salt sensitive so for me they're a little bit too high in salt but for my husband he has no issues with salt in any way shape or form his blood pressure runs low anyway i can't stand them i mean <laughs> but the plant pure nation foods are just amazing i mean the flavor I mean, there are a lot of them are Kim Campbell's recipes anyway, and she's just incredible. I mean, in, in terms of food and flavor. That's sure. great to know. That's yeah. good. I know they were having some shortages in the past, but now they're, they're up and running and everything's oh, good. They're oh. up and running and the food is incredible. And they've offered it, they offered it in like 20 packs. So I just bought a little freezer, you know, from like Home Depot for like 200 bucks. And because they take up a lot of space in your freezer. Mm. So we just keep them. And like, for example, if we're on the road and we're traveling, we just put them in the cooler and they have a little, there's, it's called the mini hot logic. I don't know if you've seen this, but basically it looks like a little lunch box with a heating pad on the bottom. So they have a converter that you can plug into the cigarette lighter in your car and we travel with them. And so we'll stop and have a hot meal. Wow you know, and, and, and have a salad, you know, I'll prepare a salad ahead of time. And, you know, so we'll have a salad and a nice hot meal. So, That's you know, fantastic. they're fabulous to travel with. The food is, is amazing. So and it comes to your door frozen. So they're ready to go. And That's so like, great. if you're taking them to work, you know, uh, the mini hot logic, I use that at work to heat up my food because I don't use microwaves. Uh -huh. So the mini hot logic is amazing. And they now have just come out with a nine by 13 size so you can have like a, a almost like a casserole so like on on thanksgiving or holidays you know when i go to the carnivores you know i'll bring a big tray of it and i'll zip it around so i don't have to get in their kitchen and deal you know and get in their way i get i come to the to the house who's ever hosting it and i'll plug it in and, and it'll be hot piping hot when when we go to eat so That's i'll take great. out like a potato dish or whatever i'm i've prepared right so That's they're just absolutely fabulous for traveling, you know, especially because I can plug it in in the car. And when we get to wherever we're going, it'll be hot, you oh, know. Wonderful. So, yeah, no, no. I, and I love, I really do love the Plant Pure Nation. The, the That's good. I know about, I haven't tried those. I know about Vistro, which also will do no oil. So I believe right. so. Vistro is also good. So, I mean, anyway, but the Plant Pure Nation is doing a lot of good in the, in the environment and helping to to create all these local pods. These pods, so, yes, 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 yes. I know. No, oh, uh, T. Con Campbell is just fantastic, and his son as well. He really started that, right? Nelson. Oh yeah. my God, Nelson's amazing. Yeah, and his lovely bride Kim. Mm -hmm. So her cookbooks. I I, I don't know. Oh, I love know. them. Oh my gosh, Plant Your Families, and oh, I love that. Yeah. No, right. Plant Your Nation, and then there's Plant Your Kitchen, and she's coming right. out with a third. And she swore she wasn't going to do any more cookbooks. <laughs> and I just went, mm -hmm, right, okay, I'll, yeah, right, okay. And now she's on number three. 
Fantastic. So that'll be coming up soon. But I just love her cookbooks. She is just amazing. Right. Seriously. She's yes. really a brilliant chef. So, yes. I mean, there's a lot of good cookbooks out there, but I really like hers a lot. So. I do too. Yes. Anyway, Dr. Shapiro, it has been absolutely, it's really, yes. it's been a pleasure. Absolutely it's pleasure. wonderful to talk to you. Really incredible. And uh, just to learn that you're, a, I knew that you were an educator, but now I know that you're a chemistry professor, which is very special. And you know also so, so much more than probably than I do as well about, about the chemicals on our, on our skin and in those products. So you really educated. Don't get me started. Uh, Don't get me started. Huh? We'll, we'll be here all night. <laughs> Right. So. I know people have said you shouldn't put anything on your skin that you wouldn't actually put in your mouth. So that's a good exactly. one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.